books called My Jesus I Love Thee, I Know Thou Art Mine. At this time, Miss Leah Nelson and Michelle Cheney will be singing a song entitled Bow the Knee. Leah and Michelle bow the knee so then every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord have trouble doing that now gonna have problems in the future that's for sure in eternity take your Bibles turn to Psalm number 73 this evening Psalm number 73 is a note just now that uh, Gisela's mother is in the hospital awaiting uh, brain surgery did not know about that but we'll pray for Gisela's uh, mother in urgent need if you, you would please. Is she here locally? Orlando, okay. So if you would remember to pray for Gisela's mother facing brain surgery. Got your places in Psalm number 73. You know when God's people get together for a, a meeting, there's nothing better than reading God's Word. You know that? And let's do so this evening. We'll read the entire Psalm, number 73. Together you follow uh, prayerfully, carefully as you read Psalm 73, beginning in the first verse. Truly, God is good to Israel, even to such as are of a clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps were had well nigh slipped, for I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. 
Therefore, pride compasseth them about as a chain. Violence covereth them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than heart could wish. They are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue walketh through the earth. Therefore his people return hither, and waters of a full cup are wrung out to them. And they say, How doth God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. Verily I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocency. For all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. If I say I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generation of thy children. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. Till I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I their end. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places, thou castest them down into destruction. How were they brought into desolation as in a moment? They are utterly consumed with terrors. As a dream when one waketh, so, O Lord, when thou awakest, thou shalt despise their image. Thus my heart was grieved, and I was pricked in my reins. So foolish was I, and ignorant. I was as a beast before thee. Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast holden me by my right hand. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel, and afterward receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. My flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For lo, they that are far from thee shall perish. Thou hast destroyed all them that go a-whoring from thee, but it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God, that I may declare all thy works. And let's pray. Father in heaven, would you uh, take this wonderfully diverse portion of Scripture and rivet it to our hearts tonight. And Lord, we sense that there would be uh, multiple people in this room passing through similar experiences with the psalmist this evening. And so, Lord, would you help us through the, uh, the mental gymnastics that uh, we go through at times, and may they uh, end uh, ultimately in a strengthened faith in the, the God of uh, our very existence. So we thank you for the time that you've given us together this evening. And, Lord, we don't know what the needs scarcely of our own heart would be. So we just ask that you work uh, emphatically, definitely, and purposefully in our, our midst just now. And I pray that you would help flesh to get out of the way for your spirit to administer that which is needful right now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Psalm 73 <clears throat> is a psalm attributed to Asaph. It is a psalm which will create just a little bit of confusion if read quickly, uh, lightly, without an understanding of what happened in, in Psalm 73. It's attributed to Asaph. Uh, we, we would recall that Asaph was one of uh, David's musicians, and there was a, there's a pivotal point that we'll refer to in a little bit in, in the psalm. And in a while, we would uh, understand that uh, Asaph is at least referenced or mentioned uh, during the time of, of the life of, of King Solomon at the dedication of the temple. It's quite possible that, that Asaph, in foresight, served with David in anticipation of the building of the temple and possibly lived to see it come to fruition in his life and perhaps participating in the uh, music details at its, its ded dedication. There's some scriptural evidence that would indicate that. Uh, but Asaph was, was a good man, a godly man, and yet he was experiencing some difficulties. And I would submit to you this evening that they're the same kind of difficulties that we experience right now. And what had happened to Asaph is that he... He had faith in God. He, he trusted God, and that's clearly seen from the very first verse where he begins, Truly God is good to Israel, even to such are as are of a clean heart. He knows that. He acknowledged that. He's always known that. But there's some things that, that happened with, with Asaph. He began to look around him, all around him, and what he saw disturbed him. Now, quite honestly, I believe we could say this evening that if we just take a glance around 
around us, not uh, too far away, perhaps in the close proximity of where we are, and, and certainly at the, the broader glance nationally and, and worldwide, there are some very disturbing things that are, are happening. In fact, as we read this, this psalm, it, it reminds us of a whole lot of politics going on right now, doesn't it? It really does. And you look at that and you say, wow, is there any justice uh, these, these guys are, are doing things and they're running a rough shot over God and they're throwing things even in the face of God himself and they seem to be getting away with that. Now this was the observation of, of Asaph that there, would, there were wicked, foolish, godless men that seemingly were prospering and all that they did, they just touched and it turns to gold. They had Midas touch, so to speak. And this was distressing and disturbing. This is not a new thing. Uh, nor is it a thing that was uniquely terminated in the time of, of Asaph. We said it extends to the current hour. I don't know about you, but it distresses me sometimes to hear uh, godless men shoot their mouth off. And then I'm reminded of things like this. Well, there is a God in heaven, and it's his mercies that uh, keep him from just zapping them and consuming them. And then I'm further reminded that we saw in Lamentations 3 most recently that it is just his mercies that keep from consuming us, his own. It's interesting that in the, the psalm in the, that we read this evening, there is uh, a mention of the word uh, chastened there in verse number 14. It was our theme of the message this morning, the chastening hand of God, the chastisement of our, of our Heavenly Father. He does chasten His own, uh, every one of His own, because he, he loves us. So this is an Old Testament reference that uh, corresponds to that as, as well. But this had actually, uh, it had shaken Asaph. And I would think that there could be some here this evening in a similar situation. How badly uh, was he shaken by this? Well, look at the second verse. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. I would remind you this evening that when we get, off our, our, get our glance off of our Heavenly Father and onto the circumstances and the men and the corruption around us, we're on slippery ground right at that moment. When we remove our eyes, we saw from our text this morning from uh, Hebrews chapter 12, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher. We didn't take time to dig out all that was there in our text this morning, but looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher, the beginning and the ending, the alpha and the omega and everything in between, looking unto Jesus. As long as we're looking to Jesus by faith and in faith, and, and not looking around, we're okay. We'd be similar to uh, Peter when Jesus called him down from that fishing vessel to come walking to him on the water. And uh, Peter did. He got out of the boat and walked on the water. And long as he was looking to Jesus, everything was fine. But the moment that he took his glance, he took his gaze off of the Lord Jesus and began looking at the frightening circumstances around him, uh, he got in trouble. And this is the experience of Asaph similarly in the second verse. My feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. And he, he continues to explain uh, what occasioned this. It was his uh, looking at the foolish, the godless, the wicked. He became uh, not only obs observant of their ways, but verse 3 refers that he was envious of that. It's easy to become envious at the prosperity, at the seeming ease and success of worldlings around us, isn't it? It's, it's easy when we look in, in the midst of all the political turmoil and everything that, uh, that happens and we, we ask, uh, where's, where's their brain? What are they thinking? What's going on? And, and we can say, why uh, can they get away with this? How can this, this be? And if we're not careful, there can even be envy uh, at their, their condition. But remember this. Would you remember this? We'll be reminded of it uh, later in the chapter. Uh, everything is not as it appears right now. It just isn't. It's not as it's going to be. Uh, God is, is graciously allowing things to occur uh, right now for this little uh, bandwidth of time uh, that's called, but it's not always going to be this way. We have been uh, lulled into a, uh, a, a gentle sleep, uh, a paralysis, as it were, in, in America, and it's even infiltrated our, our good churches into just kind of sing-song through life. Uh, we came through some of us that are older that got a few years, uh, we came through a, a time of, of great seeming success where the, the largest and the most influential and the most effective churches in America were 
uh, were independent, fundamental, fire-breathing, uh, gospel-preaching churches, but that's not true anymore. In fact, there was a bit of facade and illusion that existed back then, but we didn't know that. We were too caught up in the moment to realize that there was, uh, there was um, a lack of, of substance of, of uh, the teaching of God's Word in, in many circles that, uh, that the excitement uh, was not able to carry through uh, in the end. And so when, when the enthusiasm and the excitement and, and the forward momentum of the, the movement was gone, there was nothing to continue. And that's why many churches on the rocks today Never had anything to start with, and what uh, there was has uh, died along the way, along with some godly people that embraced that. And by the way, let's talk about something controversial for a moment. It's come to the point where we shy away from using certain words uh, because of their, their connotation. Uh, it, it's to the point uh, I have, have maintained in the past that uh, I would like to be called a biblical fundamentalist. Uh, it's to the point now where, uh, man, the word fundamentalist or fundamental is, is so um, misused and so abused and so misunderstood that it's, it's risky stuff. Some have suggested perhaps that we use the word biblicist, a Bible-believing Christian, a, a child of God who believes God's word. Well, you can use whatever top terminology that you, that you want, but God's never changed and his truth has never changed and shall never change, so regardless of what you want to call yourself, I, I was thinking that, uh, for instance, uh, uh, a fundamental Baptist church, let's just think of those three, three words. And, uh, there was a time when it was clearly understood what, what a real fundamental Baptist church was. So let's go back about 100 years if we could, just about 100 years. The, the origin of the word fundamentalist, it came from a series of papers that were written in response uh, to those who had abandoned great and essential biblical truths. They were called liberals. Now we use the word liberal to, des to describe politicians and basically everybody religious that we, that we wouldn't approve of. But in, in those days, the liberals were those who had bought uh, the devil's lie that the Bible is not really God's inspired word and that there is perhaps truth contained within the Bible, but it's open for discussion and for application and so forth. And, and the Bible doesn't really literally mean what it, uh, what it says. They were not uh, literal interpreters of the, of the Bible, which... Uh, is the only way you can make any sense out of the Bible. And they began to take liberties and to deny basic truths. And in those days, <clears throat> the essential truths of God's Word, and please understand me, there are some things that we can agree to disagree on that's not going to matter a hill of beans, but when you tamper with the deity of Christ, when you tamper with the blood atonement, when you tamper with the, the major, important, essential doctrines of, of God's Word, you have absolutely destroyed the faith, and it's not there anymore. So it was in response uh, to this rapidly uh, moving faction of people that were abandoning and deserting uh, the, the biblical truths that uh, are true and, and uh, always have been true. There were a series of papers, uh, articles that were published uh, called the, the fundamentals, fundamentals, and out of that grew the name a fundamentalist. So in the beginning, uh, properly and needfully, a fundamentalist is one who resorted to the truths of God's Word and, and maintained that they were true and that they weren't open for discussion or for grabs, or we, we must not forsake these, but there were some essential basic truths. We're not getting down to, to minor things, as we said, that we may agree to disagree on. Uh, but that was a, a fundamentalist. Now a fundamentalist is a nutcase. Now how did that happen? How did a fundamentalist become a nutcase? Well, because some are. Because some are. Because even some that would claim that name of, of fundamentalist or fundamentalism have uh, taken to themselves private interpretation of God's Word and taken liberties to teach things that just aren't so, and so the term itself has been uh, corrupted. But if, if one uh, uh, advertised to be a biblical fundamentalist, we might look close, closer to see if, if that really truly would match with, with Bible doctrine, with scriptural doctrine. Uh, but in this age of, of change and, and compromise and decay and, 
and uh, all that goes with it in the religious realm and in the political realm and the social realm. And I, I guess we could almost write Ichabod over our culture, our society, couldn't we? And couldn't we say it's, uh, it's just finished, the glory has, has departed, we haven't given up hope. And uh, I too, like uh, some others, thank God for America. Now Tyler's back with us and he's, he's really on, on the front line uh, between us and our essential liberties. He's uh, at the ready or will be soon to, uh, to help us uh, defend those, those freedoms. And, and yet we, we look at, at some of the things that are happening. We say, what in the world lies ahead for Tyler and for us and, and for others? These are certainly troubling times. And even as we could be troubled, Asaph was when he looked at that. It had shaken him. It had rattled him. He was uh, ready to slip in the midst of, of all of this. He was, he was envious. He was aware of the fact that there, there seemed to be no justice, that they were getting away with all that they were doing. They were uh, just uh, fat with their, uh, their possessions and their, their blessings, so to speak. And they were prospering. They were increasing in, in riches. And he comes to a, a very wrong and a very drastic conclusion in verse 13. Verily, I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocency. For all the day long I've been plagued and chastened every morning. He said, what's the use? Everything I've done has been useless. Just look at this crowd. Look at where it's gotten them, their lifestyle. And then there's me. Just suffering all the things that I have for this, this God of mine. And he comes to a very wrong and a very tragic conclusion. But aren't you glad for the mercies of God that will restore and renew? Because something happens in the middle of the psalm. Something abruptly happens. He's faced with something that nearly destroys him in verse 16. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. Have you ever gone to some face to face with some things in your life and it was too painful even to entertain the thought? You just stop right there and you say, I just, I can't face that. I can't go there. And this is where Asaph went. You say, that's just as low as a human being can get. And I agree, it is. But there's a pivotal verse in verse number, number 17, until I went into the sanctuary of God. Now you say, what happened to Asaph in verse 17? Well, previously, when I'd studied this out uh, some, some years ago, I had drawn the conclusion that because of Asaph's connection with David, uh, predating the temple, that it's not really that he could have gone into to the temple and to the house of God. Perhaps it, it could have been uh, the... the the sanctuary perhaps of the tabernacle uh, we don't know uh, then recently have turned up information that indeed it could have been the temple it could have been that uh, but I believe there's a greater truth that probably would transcend a physical place a location and that is uh, when the scripture says he went into the sanctuary of the Lord that means he got in touch with God he met with the Lord face to face. Don't know where it was exactly, but he went into the presence of the Lord, the sanctuary of the Lord. He went into that secret place of God. Don't know how the encounter happened. Don't know how he was jogged back to, to spiritual reality, but it was in the presence of the Lord that it occurred. Could it have been that someone, some godly man, some godly person pointed him to the truths? Could it be that someone admonished him? Could it be that someone rebuked him because of his uh, wrong thinking? Well, that we, we don't know, but we do know that he came face to face with the truth and in the presence of the Lord, he says, then understood I therein. And as you know, the content of Psalm 73 changes radically at verse 17. Everything is down, 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 discouragement. I've done this in vain. There's no use. Look at how these people are, are prospering. And there's poor little me over here just trying to live for God. Until he went into the presence of the Lord. He went into the sanctuary of the Lord. Then I understood their end. It may be that Asaph and, and God had a little conversation, much as Job did. Remember Job's conversation? Now, we think that Job was, uh, was an upright man that uh, hated evil, that eschewed evil, and that uh, feared God, and that he was. The Scripture says that about Job. And we think that, that Job uh, endured his testing and graduated with an A+, plus, and, and that he did. But there was a time when his three friends got to him a little bit. 
as he sat in the ashes and the dust with these three friends and listened to their religious tirade, which was basically wrong from beginning to end, his faith was shaken somewhat, and he began to get in God's face. And I use that term respectfully, but that's what Job did. He began to ask some, some wrong questions of God. And God listened to Job for a little while, and then God and Job sat down and had a conversation, and it began something like this. Job, where were you when I made all this? And from there he continued. And, you know, Job got the right perspective then from God, and he understood fully, fully, uh, what God was doing and how he was doing his life and his, his right and his uh, ability to do that as his creator. And that way he was able to come out and say, I know that my Redeemer liveth. And what a wonderful testimony we have. I believe a similar situation occurred with Asaph in Psalm 73. When he went into the sanctuary, the presence of God, uh, he and God did business. He got some information from God and then he understood their end. Now he elaborates on the fact that it is indeed those guys that have their feet in slippery places. Now, who was it in the beginning of Psalm 73 who was set in slippery places? Well, it was Asaph himself. He said, for me, my steps were, were well, uh, they were nigh gone. My feet were almost gone. My steps, steps had well nigh slipped. And now he recognizes, I'm not in slippery places. These guys are. They don't know it. I thought it was me, but it's really them. Uh, they are in slippery places. Thou castest them down into destruction. And we will not uh, take time to elaborate. We've read all of this, but he understands full well what's going to happen to this uh, godless crowd that seems to be prospering for the moment. And again, let us reflect upon the fact that a, a merciful God allows wicked men to continue in seeming uh, prosperity and blessing for the moment. And don't let that get to you. Don't let that bother you. So I suppose that among the richest of men would be the most ungodly. There would be some exceptions to that. Some of you would have, have known some, some rich and, and godly men. There are a few names that would shine uh, brightly. I'm thanking, thankful for uh, Truett Cathy, founder of Chick-fil-A. He's taken a lot of heat and a lot of criticism in a, in a lot of ways. And uh, I know he's not a, a perfect man. You may disagree with him in some things, but I'm thankful for uh, a rich man who's been uh, willing to take a stand and say, I think we should be closed on, on Sundays. He realized that for many, many years, people said, Kathy, you'll never make it. You can't survive closed on Sunday. You can't do it. And he said, I think it's better to honor God than it is to try to make a buck, so this is what I'm going to do. And it seems to be working rather well for, for him. And so I'm thankful for some that, that do take a stand. I'm thinking of, of uh, uh, one that was, would predate most of us here, but a few of you would know the name R.G. Letourneau. R.G. Letourneau. How many of you knew about R.G. Letourneau? Okay, some of you did. R.G. Letourneau was a man involved in, in the manufacture of, of heavy equipment, heavy equipment. Uh, way back years ago, uh, my one grandfather worked for Letourneau's for a while, for R.G. Letourneau. And uh, he was a believer. <clears throat> he was a, a child of God. And he was some difficulty trusted God to, to tithe. And he had received some biblical teaching that tithing uh, was, was what you're supposed to do. And uh, to him, it didn't make much sense to give away 10% of what you had, but he decided he would trust God to do that. And so he did. And it worked well for him. God blessed that. You know why he did? Because he said he would. He said he would. He said... Prove me, saith the Lord, and see if I won't pour out a blessing. Well, God poured out a blessing to R.G. Letourneau, and so I don't know exactly how it happened exactly, but Letourneau said, well, you know, if, if giving 10% is good, then uh, let's go for 20%. And he began to give 20%, and God blessed him. Real good, he blessed him. And he went from 20% to 30%, and from 30 to 40, and 50, and 60, and 70, and you guessed it, he ended up giving 90% of all that he had to God and living off of the tithe. Oh, isn't that amazing? He trusted God just to give a tithe, and ultimately God blessed him to the point that he could live off of the tithe and give the 90% to God. And he impacted uh, men eternally with, uh, with his business and, and with his faithfulness to God. So we're thankful for uh, a few rich and, and prominent examples that we have, but by and large... Uh, by and large, uh, we, we sort of know, due, due to their own confession, to their own mouth, uh, where people stand that are involved in success and riches. 
and uh, yet we must be acquainted with this fact these guys speaking of the ungodly crowd apart from from the Lord Jesus apart from God right now they've got everything that they'll ever have and this is it this is good as it'll ever get for them and so we need not be envious of that should we but think about us think about poor little us you say well here I am trying to, to love God and live for God and I've got nothing and I don't know anybody and I'm not making any difference in anybody's life for eternity and, and here are these wicked people out there living and prospering and we can fall into the same trap that Asaph did but remember this for them they've got all they're ever going to have and they're going to lose all of that and then they're going to lose their own soul and for us this is as bad as it's ever going to get it's never going to get worse than this and from here it'll get better and if we do lose all of this someone suggested today that would be a good thing if we lose all of this real soon uh, wouldn't it be a desirable thing just to to pass from this realm into the Lord's presence uh, just now and to enjoy the uh, the the bliss of eternity in the presence of the Lord and we think about uh, some different things having discussion with our men this this week uh, you know the, the splendor of heaven of the of the mansions that Jesus is uh, preparing for us of the the golden street of the uh, the precious stones that just make the the foundation stones of of the celestial city and all that really doesn't make any difference does it it's really sort of incidental it's not really going to compare to the person of our Lord Jesus that we'll spend eternity with and you know the blessed part is that we can spend time with him right now and we don't sometimes we think as Christians oh it'd just be wonderful when we get to heaven and we can be with Jesus you can be with Jesus right now you can be just as close and dear and near and he can be just as precious to you right now as he will in heaven of course it'll be in a, a new uh, respect of course in, in eternity free from the, the restraints of, of this flesh of this body now uh, but uh, think of, of the fact that Asaph was envious until the blinders came off until God, God met with him and reminded him this is all they have and it's nothing because it's all going to pass away and I'm thinking of the conclusion of where he, he left it spiritually and he, he received conviction verse 21 thus my heart was grieved and I was pricked in my reins foolish was I and ignorant I was as a beast before thee the conviction fell because of his wrong thinking which was straightened out by the truth of God's Word are you brave enough to let your wrong thinking be corrected by the Word of God did you know that Christians today abound with wrong thinking sometimes we adopt the thinking uh, the wrong thinking <clears throat> of the world we we live as if the consequences will never set in God's Word says be not deceived God is not mocked for whatsoever a man soweth that shall he also reap that's good negatively and positively as well if you sow evil you're gonna reap it if you sow righteousness you're gonna reap that the reaping and sowing the promise of, of God uh, we think that the, the day is coming and certainly uh, this should bring about conviction and, and grief and a pricking of our, our reins and acknowledgement of our foolishness and a correction of our thinking so that we bring it into alignment with the truth of, of God's Word. But think of the blessed, restored fellowship that Asaph had with God at the end of this psalm. Verse 23, Nevertheless, I am continually with thee. Thou hast holden me by the right hand. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel and afterward receive me to glory. Now let me ask you a question tonight. If that were true of Asaph, and if that be true of us as children of God today, what more in this world could you possibly want? What is there that you could possibly want that would excel the prospects of that type of relationship with the God of our creation. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel, and afterward receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but thee? There is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. 
They spoke a few moments ago about uh, magnifying and praising the Lord's name in heaven and bowing the knee and how illy prepared we might be if we live lives uh, absent from the truth of the relationship that God has for us right now in this little avenue called time while we're still alive here on earth. My flesh, my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Verse 28 is a, a summary verse that concludes, but it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all my works. Well, there was a revival that occurred in Psalm 73, and it was Asaph that got revived, and it happened because he went into the presence of the Lord. And friends, that's why it's important for us to go into the presence of the Lord daily, continually, to live in the presence of the Lord so we can experience his, his reviving presence daily. It's good. That enables us to, to trust the Lord. And then there's something that happens as a result of that. Uh, we don't sit, sit back in satisfaction and complacency and say, well, uh, good for me. I got that all settled with God. I'm, I'm good to go. But he concludes the psalm by saying that I may declare all by works. You know, if you have a right relationship with God experientially in your life, uh, there will be no way that you can keep from sharing that with other people and encouraging them uh, to come along as the Lord invites and receive the invitation the Lord has given in, in every dispensation, in every age. God is longing for his creation to come and commune and walk and fellowship with him. He craved that in the Garden of Eden when there were only two human beings. He craves that now when there are untold billions upon earth. And he craves that from you and from me right now. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we thank you for the, the truth that is uh, given to us in this psalm. And Lord, we would confess along with Asaph uh, that there have been things that have clouded the vision and uh, dimmed the luster of your glory and have caused our uh, focus to, to be moved from you. Lord, it has shaken our faith and has caused our feet to be placed in slippery places. Lord, as we come acknowledging that, would you send revival and restoration and renewal of our fellowship with you. And Lord, if there be one who's never really by faith trusted the Lord Jesus fully as God and Savior, I pray that that would be taken care of. We know it's your will. So we don't have to ask what your will is, but we just ask for your sweet spirit to do his work. And Lord, just cause your will to be done in every heart present this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The invitation that Rob will use for us is number 300. And 65, I am thine, O Lord, I have heard thy voice. 365, the altars are open, we we'll meet you at the front, let you go with someone and counsel with a copy of God's word, uh, whatever your need is. If it could be uh, met this evening, if we could help in doing that, love to do that this evening. 365, let's stand together as we sing.